bookstore, 85 years old and still independent. I'm Jessica Strand, the events director. Um, I say this joke about 375 times now, so it's no longer funny, but I am not related to the Strand family, <laughs> or my own Strand family, but not the Bass family who owns the bookstore. Um, tonight we have two prize-winning, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists and writers who will talk about each other's books and their own process of researching, writing, and shaping their ideas into intimate portraits of Mahatma Gandhi and Stanley Ann Dunham, also referred to as Barack Obama's mother. Joseph Lillefeld worked for the New York Times for nearly 40 years. During the time, he served as foreign editor and managing editor. His books include Move Your Shadow, South Africa Black and White, and Omaha Blues, A Memory Loop, and most recently one of the books which will be discussed this evening, Great Soul, Mahatma Gandhi and His Struggle with India. Lilfeld is also a frequent contributor to the New York Times, to the New York Review of Books. He will be in conversation with journalist and writer Jenny Scott. Scott was at the New York Times for 15 years, during which time she was part of the team of editors and reporters who worked on a series on race called How Race is Lived in America, and on a series on social class in America entitled Class Matters. She is also responsible, along with the Times editor, of conceiving the portraits of grief, which were small portraits, 2,600 of the victims of 9-11. Tonight, her popular book, A Singular Woman, The Untold Story of Barack Obama, the Mother, will also be discussed. Lilfeld and Scott will talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor for discussions, and then they'll sign their books. Please join me in welcoming Joseph Lillefeld and Janet Scott. Thank you. short passage uh, from the beginning that I think gives you a sense of, of uh, the subject and of the book. And I, it comes shortly after the beginning of the book where I established the fact that really all we knew about uh, Ann Dunham uh, early on was that she was a quote white woman from Kansas. That was the kind of trope that arose out of the president's, the then Senator, then Senator Obama's characterization of her on the campaign and in the 2004, uh, at, the, at the convention in 2004. So uh, I then go on to say, to describe Dunham as a white woman from Kansas is about as illuminating as describing her son as a politician who likes golf. Intentionally or not, the label obscures an extraordinary story of a girl with a boy's name who grew up in the years before the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the Vietnam War, and the pill, who married an African at a time when nearly two dozen states still had laws against interracial marriage, who at 24 moved to Jakarta with her son in the waning days of an anti-communist bloodbath in which hundreds of thousands of Indonesians are believed to have been slaughtered, who lived more than half of her adult life in a place barely known to most Americans, in an ancient and complex culture, in a country with the largest Muslim population in the world, who spent years working in villages where an unmarried Western woman was a rarity, who immersed herself in the study of a sacred craft long practiced exclusively by men, who, as a working and mostly single mother, brought up two biracial children, who adored her children and believed her son in particular had the potential to be great, who raised him to be, as he has put it jokingly, a combination of Albert Einstein, Mahatma Gandhi, and Harry Belafonte, then died at 52, <laughs> never knowing who or what he would become. Had she lived, Dunham would have been 66 years old on January 20th, 2009, when Barack Obama was sworn in as the 44th President of the United States. Dunham was a private person with depths not easily fathomed. In a conversation in the Oval Office in July 2010, President Obama described her to me as both naively idealistic and sophisticated and smart. 
She was deadly serious about her work, he said, yet had a sweetness and generosity of spirit that resulted occasionally in her being taken to the cleaners. She had an unusual openness, it seems, that was both intellectual and emotional. Quote, at the foundation of her strength was her ability to be moved, unquote, her daughter Maya Satoru Ang once told me. Yet she, yet she was fun, tough, tough and funny. Moved to tears by the suffering of strangers, she could be steely in motivating her children. She wept in movie theaters, but could detonate a wide, wisecrack so finely targeted that no one in earshot ever forgot. She devoted years of her life to helping poor people, many of them women, get access to credit. But she mismanaged her own money, borrowed repeatedly from her banker mother, and fell deeply in debt. In big and small ways, she lived bravely, yet she feared doctors, possibly to her detriment. She was afraid of riding the New York City subway system. She never learned to drive. At the height of her career, colleagues remember Dunham as an almost regal presence, decked out in batik and silver, descending upon Javanese villages with an entourage of younger Indonesian bankers, formidably knowledgeable about Indonesian textiles, archaeology, the mystical sim symbolism of the wavy-bladed Javanese kris, bearing a black bag stuffed with field notebooks and a, a thermos of black coffee, a connoisseur of delicacies such as tempeh and sayur loda, an eggplant stew, regaling her colleagues with humorous stories, joking one, about one day being reincarnated as an Indonesian blacksmith, and protesting slyly all the while that she was just a girl from Kansas. Your turn. I wish I had two paragraphs as good as those. <laughs> I, I, what I thought of reading was, uh, a passage that describes Gandhi's unusual conduct on the day that India became independent. Now, just to set the context a bit, it was a very stressful time, of course. It was also the day that Pakistan was partitioned off from what had been British India, and there had been a lot of killing. Killing was still going on. And Gandhi, who had been the personification of the of the national movement, of the independence movement, refused to go to the independence celebration in, uh, in uh, New Delhi. Uh, it, it was, he never quite spelled out why, but you could read it as a protest against the partition and against the killing. And, uh, and his unhappiness about, not that India was becoming independent, but about the way it was becoming independent, because after all, he, he was the uh, great exponent of nonviolence. Um, so here goes. So he's in Calcutta on, on August 15th, 1947. He'd been saying that he'd devote himself to fasting and spinning on Independence Day, August 15th. When the BBC asked that he record a special independence mes message, the old man replied, they must forget that I know English. When All India Radio came with a similar request, he said, I've run dry. He awoke at 2 a.m. that day after only three hours of sleep. Belagatia, that's the section where he was staying, was quiet at that early hour, but a small, mostly Muslim crowd was waiting outside to congratulate him on the achievement of freedom. When daylight came, larger crowds began to gather. Strikingly, they were mixed. Hindus and Muslims, who had been taking up offensive and defensive positions days earlier, were now celebrating together. According to contemporary reports, they were embracing and calling each other brothers. The euphoria lasted two weeks. Instead of another great Calcutta killing, that was something that had happened a year earlier, uh, intercommunal riots in which 4,000 people died in about a week. There, there was suddenly talk of a Calcutta miracle, which many were quick to attribute to Gandhi's presence and the example he'd set. With Sururati at the wheel, that's a Muslim colleague, Gandhi went out for a drive two nights in a row to witness the big civic party, soak up the joy. At first, he wouldn't allow himself to be drawn in, even when crowds in a Muslim section surrounded the car crying, Jai Hin. That, uh, that means glory to India. At his prayer meetings on the 15th and 16th, he spoke with chagrin about the rampaging celebrants who'd surged through Government House, the former seat of the Viceroys, newly turned over to an Indian government, governor on Independence Day, stealing the silver, defacing pictures, 
more or less in the spirit of the rowdy crowd that celebrated Andrew Jackson's inauguration by ransacking the White House. And as reports came in on rioting in Lahore, on the other side of the subcontinent, Gandhi went on mournfully about the bloodshed with which independence was being marked. His doubts about the du durability of the Calcutta miracle persisted. What if this is just a momentary enthusiasm, he wrote to Patel, that was one of his old colleagues. From one moment to the next, he was torn between weariness and hope. At the mixed throngs, as the mixed throngs of Hindus and Muslims that turned out almost daily to hear him in Surawadi continued to swell to half a million or more, it was reported on at least two occasions. He was reminded of the high tide of, uh, we'll just have to, I won't even explain this, <laughs> of the Caliphate movement that had swept him into a position of national leadership, not something that had happened 25 years earlier. One might almost say that the joy of fraternization is leaping up from hour to hour, he allowed himself to write. Uh, just, go, just go a little further. Sashi Surawadi, that's this Muslim colleague, who tried to maneuver him out of East Bengal earlier in the year, now basked in the glow of the Mahatma, paying him tribute for the joy and relief Calcutta was drawing from its astonishing plunge into amity. All this is due to the infinite mercy of Allah and the good work of our devoted Bapu. Bapu means father, and that's what Gandhi was widely called. This Muslim leaguer said, Mountbatten, now governor general of an independent India, he had been the viceroy, noted that a boundary force under British officers had been dispatched to the Punjab in, in the hopes of containing the violence there. In the Punjab, he wrote, we have 55,000 soldiers and large-scale rioting on our hands. In Bengal, our forces consist of one man, and there is no <laughs> rioting. May I be allowed to pay my tribute to the one-man boundary force? So I'm going to start. Um, it's been said about this book that what you did was was humanize Gandhi, that you took the saintly icon that he often seems to have become in the popular imagination, and you explored some of the contradictions, eccentricities, struggles with himself, uh, disappointments, even in some cases failures. But, but that's not really what you set out to do, is it? And uh, is that a misunderstanding of the book, or is it a, a bonus for the reader? Well, it's a bonus for me, I suppose, if people find in it. Uh... Uh, something that's rewarding, but, uh, and I, I can't contradict it, but that was a surprising reaction, uh, surprising to me, because I didn't think I was humanizing Gandhi. I never imagined that he was anything other than human. And uh, uh, I was guided in part by, uh, you know, there, there were times when, when actually uh, at the mass level, uh, in the, some Indians, thought of Gandhi as a, as a god, or an avatar of some, of some divine presence. And he had, at various occasions, in his early career in particular, to vigorously deny that he was, that he was divine. Uh, but but I, never, uh, I never set out to humanize him. I, I think one of the appeals, of the, one of the things most appealing about the man is how, how human he is and how, how what he became is such a, a, a self-creation, a, a kind of a, a result of what I've been calling his moral ambition, a phrase I didn't think to put in the book, but, but it's been coming to my mind as I talk about the book, because at every stage of his life, Gandhi was trying to improve himself morally and, and, and to find that a more effective way of, of uh, changing and reforming India. Uh, but, so yes, you're right, that, that was a response I got, and I guess I think of it as a bonus. I, I'm gonna follow, because I have a question that's related to that. Um, 
Gandhi was an unusual figure in, in many ways, um, not the least of which was um, to some things that to contemporary readers I think would seem pretty eccentric. Uh, he was celibate from 1906 on. He tested himself by sleeping naked with young women, young girls, uh, including his niece, as I believe. Grand niece. Grand niece. Uh, he tried various uh, interesting regimens, including mud packs, nature cures. Uh, he was a fruititarian for a period. Another time, tried to subsist on a single meal a day. Um, I'm curious whether it's difficult to write about a person with uh, eye-catching uh, habits like that, or uh, things that they try out to, to modern for modern readers, and avoid uh, being having your subject be grossly oversimplified into, for example, as one of your reviewers put it, a sexual weirdo. I mean, how did you go about, uh, when you were working on it, did you have to think about how to present these kinds of uh, practices in order for them not to be so alienating to uh, uh, people in a completely different period and different culture? I don't know that I consciously worried about that too much. Uh, a lot of these things can be explained within uh, uh, movements of thought. At the time Gandhi uh, was living, uh, his, his many and millions of Indians were vegetarians, some even by choice. Uh, and, uh, but uh, Gandhi was very taken up with British vegetarianism when he lived in London. And, uh, uh, so the, his preoccupation with diet gets gets tied up with his preoccupation with celibacy, uh, and because he he begins as as various Asian traditions do to distinguish between uh, foods which are uh, uh, have aphrodisiac qualities and foods which do the opposite, and uh, and part of his Part of his preoccupation with diet was not to eat food but, uh, that are sometimes called in Chinese and Indian traditions heating. Uh, and uh, so, so that's that's part of the story. Uh, the choice of celibacy uh, came after he he uh, had a father four sons. He'd been married for over twenty years, uh, uh, and. What was interesting about it was that Gandhi was re reinterpreting a kind of Indian religious tradition in which a man becomes what's called a sannyasi and, and, and uh, brace, basically breaks his ties to family and material things and the uh, possessions of the world and goes out to seek his salvation as a, as a spiritual pilgrim. Well, Gandhi thought of himself as a political sannyasi. His, he, he did all those things, but in, uh, in, uh, in, in service to the country. And he thought, he thought that, that politics was really the religious duty of Indians in the period in which he lived. Uh, so again, I, I think many of those things may strike us, urban Westerners of a certain background, certain backgrounds, uh, living in a place like New York, as strange. They're less strange in India, and many of them, many of them uh, uh, contributed to the, to the hold that he had on, on the Indian population, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, he came back, he lived in South Africa for 21 years, came back to uh, India in, in middle age, in that period, you'd almost say late middle age. And, and uh, he was slightly known in the country, but not widely known. This was not an era of mass communications. And within five or six years, he was the national leader of the subcontinent. Uh, uh, with, with, uh, and millions knew his name, and turned out by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands to hear him and see him when he campaigned. Uh, and understanding how that happened and what they saw in him, some part of it had to do with the way he uh, uh, changed his dress and uh, uh, stripped down to the mode of a poor Indian peasant. 
but it, uh, they saw in him a man who cared for them in a new and different way. So they didn't see a peculiar person, they saw a really committed person. Now it's your turn to take questions. No more, no, no more defensive strategies. Um, okay, well, uh, Miss Dunham uh, was famously introduced by her son to the country as a, a white woman from Kansas. That conjures up a certain image, kind of a rural image, of perhaps a farming in, image, of bread baking in the stove and, uh, and uh, animals around. And, uh, uh, and I, just, I just wonder uh, whether, what kind of Kansas family she came from. And, uh, and while you answer that, perhaps you could, uh, and what was Kansas like, the Kansas she was born in? How long did she stay? But also, you, perhaps you could tell us how she got the name Stanley. Uh, yes, we, we've always, as I alluded to before, uh, thought of her as, as the woman from Kansas. And the interesting thing is actually she almost, she barely lived in Kansas. Her parents were from Kansas. They were from small towns near Wichita, oil towns from the oil boom that occurred there in the 20s. They had uh, grown up in this time of incredible, um, this just burst of uh, economic energy in these tiny towns that had transformed them from basically villages to uh, teeming um, you know, camps almost uh, for a period of about a decade. I think that, that part of Kansas was producing something like, you know, I can't remember the number, but some large percentage of all of the oil being produced by this country was being produced in those immediate towns at that time. Um, so they were, they were indeed, her parents, this small town Kansas couple from depression period, which can, conjures up something in our minds that I think actually when you look at their story is really uh, a lot, or is, is not accurate. Uh, they were quite unconventional, surprisingly, because uh, the, the whole way we've been sort of told about them is, oh, well, they're, you know, rock rib, you know, uh, all American white people. Um, actually, you know, her father was, uh, a guy who was quite uncomfortable in his little town, like, wanted very much to get out, left as early as he could. Her mother, to my amazement, because we think of Ann Dunham as such a, uh, you know, a deviation from the family history, her mother actually did some of the things that Ann did. She married uh, Stanley, the father, in secret as a high school senior without telling her parents because her parents couldn't stand him. He was, you know, older and, uh, they sort of looked down on him for class reasons as well. And then she broke them the news as soon as she got out of school and they left immediately for California. And her mother then became the breadwinner in this family from then on uh, because he was kind of uh, romantic and, and never quite settled on what he wanted to do. He had ambitions to be a writer, et cetera. Anyhow, they, that kind of peripatetic quality in her life uh, is, you begin to see it in their life. In the first 14 years of Ann Dunham's life, Stanley Ann Dunham's life, they moved six or seven times. Uh, as for her name, um, the president all led us to believe in his memoir, Dreams from My Father, that she was named, uh, that, that the, the line was always that Stanley Dunham wanted a boy and he got her and so he named her Stanley. Um, actually, I found uh, an interesting thing. The relatives in that family, all of whom talked to me, said um, Madeline Dunham would never have ceded to Stanley the naming of their child and certainly wouldn't have given uh, their child his name uh, just because he, you know, wanted a boy and he would not have particularly uh, been, he certainly wouldn't have been disappointed to have a girl. So they didn't buy that story. And it turned out that in these small towns in Kansas, Madeline Payne, as a child, had been a great fan of Betty Davis, who was in her heyday then and in, in coming into the, the Depression and then immediately afterward. And right the summer that, um, Ann, that Ann Dunham, Stanley Ann, was born, and she was born in November, the summer before that when Madeline was pregnant, uh, Betty Davis had a new movie out in which she played a character called Stanley Timberlake. And um, shortly after Anne was born and given the name Stanley Ann, uh, a relative asked Madeline, you know, what's with the name? And she said, well, you know, Betty Davis played a character named Stanley. So my sense is that it had as much to do with Betty Davis as with anything else. Uh, there was a tradition in the family, an admiration for Stanley 
uh, of Stanley and Livingston uh, that had led to the name coming into the family early on. But anyway, it's a very kind of all-American uh, story, but with a real twist, I think. Okay, you got in two questions. Okay. I'll toss a second. Um, as one reads through, reads your book, uh, you discover that she had two husbands. The second marriage ended fairly early when she was, what, a woman of about 30? In her 30s, yeah. In her 30s. And she lived for another 20 years. And, and, uh, and uh, you describe some relationships she, she had with men over, over those years and even before. Uh, and and uh, weren't you a little nervous at the time that you were writing it that this would provide fodder for the gossip mills of, uh, on the webs on, in, on the web and uh, for, for for unfriendly bloggers uh, and and that it would be misunderstood? You're 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 describing uh, a modern woman who had led a complicated life. Uh, but it could easily have been turned around. And yet, and yet your book, uh, you don't seem to have held anything back, but the book uh, did not produce that kind of controversy, I suppose, to the relief of the White House. Uh, uh, how do you account for that? Uh, it, it's true. I, I was very conscious of the fact that I was writing about a, a woman who was quite unconventional for her time. I would say, now, her life would not be perceived to be quite as, as different as it was then, although uh, she certainly would have been brave at any time. Um, and yes, she did have a complex, emotional, um, romantic life uh, over the course of a lifetime that ended abruptly at 52. Uh, so uh, it, she packed a lot into a relatively, you know, half of a lifetime for other people. Uh, but she, she lived fully. She had two husbands. She had other lovers. And I was very conscious of uh, the fact that the book was going to be scrutinized because there's so much attention to uh, Obama, pro and con. And there's a lot of attention on the internet to Obama's mother, uh, pro and con. So I figured anything I put in there was going to be, um, you know, in danger of being uh, plucked out of context. And um, so, and I also felt writing this book as a woman that I, and, and knowing that Ann Dunham was basically a private individual who, through no fault of her own, was cast into the spotlight long after her death by the success of her son, um, I felt there was some obligation to both tell her true story and capture her real life, because she would not have been ashamed, of my, I suspect, of anything in the way she lived. Uh, but I also didn't want to, um, you know, shine the, the wrong kind of light onto a private person. So I, I really struggled with how to present these relationships, and, and some of them involved people who were no longer alive, and she was no longer alive, and, you know, and there was a whole question about ability to confirm things. So. I, I find, and I, then I also wrestled with the question of how interested would we be in the small passing uh, relationships of a male subject uh, like her. And so I, I feel that I, you know, it's, it's clear if you read the book that she had a number of relationships with um, the, the longest, the, the, the most serious relationship in her later life was with a man who was close to the age of her son at the time, an Indonesian man. Um, and I describe these relationships in, in the book, but I think I tried to put them in, in context uh, and, and not uh, sensationalize them. And, and as a result, they don't so far appear to have been sensationalized. Should we stop now, or should we keep going with our, uh, maybe we, should we bring some people in? Well, sure. Does anyone have questions? any questions? <laughs> what year was she born? 1942. Yes. Of course, you both mentioned, um, right, so both your subjects were deceased before you started these books. Um, and you can't confirm things by interviewing them. What do you, what do, you do? Well, um, there's a big difference between the two subjects uh, uh, in that sense. My, my subject was, is one of the most written about 
individuals of the last hundred years. I, I'm not sure. Think about who, what figures in uh, 20th century figures were most written about. You can imagine Churchill or Roosevelt. I'm not sure that Gandhi hasn't been written about more than either of them. Uh, probably have to go to the Library of Congress to figure that out. But you have a uh, scholarly indus cottage industry on Gandhi working in India, South Africa, uh, England, and the United States. And, and new Gandhi books come out regularly. Uh, his collected works exist in uh, 100 volumes. Uh, and that's collected, not complete. Uh, there are ar major archives in London, Delhi, Ahmedabad, uh, Calcutta. Uh, there's no dearth of Gandhi material. Uh, uh, and it's still possible to speak to people who were influenced uh, by him or who knew him in some sense. Uh, and, it, and there are numerous descendants who have views about him and I've written about him and I, I met, you know, I'm not a scholar. I didn't spend all my time in archives. I spent some time in archives, but I, uh, I, I traveled a lot. For me, it was important uh, to see the places where the various major events of his life occurred. I, I think that's just out of my, it's hard to say what I accomplished by doing that. Uh, except that I met in various regions local scholars who'd gone into things more deeply than more remote scholars had and found out that some of the established stories about Gandhi uh, were not generally accepted in the place where events happened. So that was helpful. Uh, but uh, mostly I, I interviewed Gandhi by reading him. I can't say I read every one of those hundred volumes cover to cover, but I, 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 was, I had a thematic approach. I had my angle. I had things I was looking for. Uh, and I had questions in my mind I wanted to answer. And, and that drove my research, such as it was. And, and mine was very different because it was more like, I mean, more like doing contemporary journalism real, real time, even though she, she'd been dead uh, since the mid-90s. But a lot of the people were still alive who knew her, and the book is basically a reported book. There's not a lot of archival material on her life. I was able to look at her field notes, her anthropological field notes, and her work from the Ford Foundation, the files there, and her le a lot of letters and some personal documents. But, but basically, the book is based on interviews with close to 200 people, including her children. Um, so my principle was, uh, that I tried to get things confirmed from multiple sources if, where, where possible. And I confess I was relatively conservative because I knew, again, that the book was going to be scrutinized and I was writing about the mother of the president. So if things felt shaky, I was pretty, uh, I tended to, um, I left out things that I couldn't absolutely confirm. Um, there were some things that I had to have, you know, try and ask the White House for confirmation. For example, um, I interviewed uh, um, when I was in Indonesia uh, the houseboy, a man who had been the houseboy in the house that Ann Dunham had lived in when she first moved to Indonesia, and he told me some things about what went on in that household that there was really nobody else left to confirm it. So I really had to, I had to run that by the president <laughs> through, uh, you know, a spokesman. Um, so it wasn't. It wasn't always easy to get confirmation, but that's, that's how I went about it. Can I, can I follow that up? I guess, um, so what was the, like, you weren't able to ask them questions. What questions would you have asked? Ask who? Uh, your your subjects. subjects. Well, well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, let me answer that really quickly. My, my, my main unanswered question from my book is a deeper understanding of the, the nature of the relationship between uh, Anne Dunham and, and her son, uh, which is not what I set out to do. I set out really to write a book about her, knowing that that was not something I was going to get to when she was dead, get to accurately or with confidence when she was dead and he was president. But that's the thing I would ask her. And, and you know, whether you get an honest answer out of anyone on that or a knowing answer, it's, it's a hard question to answer for anybody. But that, that's my, my big unanswered question. Um, the my answer to that question is the, uh, the, the theme of 
my book is that Gandhi came back from South Africa with a kind of social philosophy and various social justice goals clearly in his mind and, and an ambition to transform India uh, uh, in matters having to do with communal relations between Hindus and Muslims, in matters having to do with caste and untouchability, and, and uh, in terms of the poorest Indians and living in villages, uh, 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 the, the really the most among the most impoverished people on the planet. Um, and he was a great success in the, in the fact that he led what can probably be characterized as the first national mass movement, anti-colonial mass movement that the 20th century saw. That, uh, he, he left behind a, uh, a kind of doctrine of nonviolence that's, that has been widely influential, not least in our own civil rights movement, but in the this, this matter of these social values, which I was particularly concerned with in this book, uh, uh, I think you'd have to say he failed. And I think, I think I show that he himself felt that he had failed on these, on, on these various points. And, and that's why he felt so, so raw and sad at the end of his life in many respects. He was still recognized as the national leader, but but uh, so many of his values had not been embraced. And, and, uh, and from my point of view, that injects a note of tragedy in Gandhi's story and uh, in the story of modern India. Uh, so now that's my, that's my line of thinking. And I think I, I advance a lot of uh, evidence for it. Uh, from Gandhi's own words, from his own life. But I, I would have liked to have had the opportunity to say, this is how I interpret, near the end of his life, this is how I interpret your experience. Am, am I, uh, does this speak to you? Is this, is this, it? Is this how, you, how, you, how you felt it? I have a question. Uh, I'm curious to what extent, if any, as you were sketching these portraits of two different people, of Gandhi and Obama's mother, uh, you were aware of each other revealing something about yourselves. You are watching Jenny and you watching Joe. You just revealed something about us that we haven't said. We are a household. Uh, uh, well, Jani revealed something about herself uh, that I, I had known, but uh, she challenged herself and revealed what a wonderful writer she was by taking on the most ambitious writing project so far. I think what he means is, I'm assuming, the, the choice of subject and the approach to the subject. And the day by day kind of uh, the, the, the grist that uh, was being milled. Uh, it, you were writing them in tandem. Right, we were, yeah. yeah. But we were actually, we were, we were writing them off site. And we, you know, while we, I benefited far more from Joe's. Uh, uh, proximity than he did for mine <laughs> in terms of my book because I, I bounced a lot of ideas off him. Um, I never I, I, I can't think that I learned something about you that I that I uh, didn't know uh, before by watching you do it. Um, but it was a an awesome uh, thing to witness. Um, but I can't say that I saw I had an insight into you that I hadn't had before. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, would you say there was more pressure in tackling and trying to find something new about a subject that was very well written about it, or chat tackling the subject that has not been written about, and all the and most of the people, like the sources that you would need, are aging, kind of race against the clock, kind of thing. You know, wherever your sources can actually go away, whereby you have to do something. 
That's interesting. I mean, I, I fortunately I didn't have to experience both pressures, so I only knew the pressure that I was under. Um, I didn't. I mean, I lost Madeline Dunham. She did agree, the mother. She she did agree to talk to me, but wanted to do it after the, the election. Uh, and if she died, of course, two days before the election. Uh, but nobody else that I was going after died while I was in pursuit. Um, but there, you know, there was a lot of pressure to get, for one thing, there was a lot of pressure to get it done within a, a very, uh, I had a two-year book contract, and the publisher was highly conscious of the ebb and flow of the president's popularity, and and they did not, you know, want this book to come out uh, if he was going to cease to be. Period. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, you know, just covering someone's entire life, especially someone who's never been written about, um, in and getting it written in two years, felt to me like a pretty tight deadline. Although I, I think there's a lot worse nowadays. Um, Joe had a completely different problem. Well, I started with an idea and some, as I said, with some questions in my mind. Uh, and I spent some time at the beginning talking to scholars who had spent their lives studying Gandhi to see whether anybody was going to say to me, that's not a valid approach. Uh, uh, but. Uh, I, I once once I had some confidence in my approach and, and the, the path I was taking, I, I didn't uh, I, I, I didn't have, I didn't feel anxious about not being able to uh, buttonhole people who've been dead for thirty years. You know, but, uh, that, that was wasn't a problem. That was the those were the terms of, uh, of, of the project. I Financial dealings with, with entities like the Soviet Union and its uh, major commercial concerns dealt in international commodities. Uh, you better be careful getting into all that if you don't have good source material. But, uh, uh, and and uh, all human psyches are, and memories are uh, subject to distortion. Uh, so. They were all useful. Gandhi's autobiography is a great book, but you, if you pay attention to the what, everyone should read it. But if you pay attention to, to the circumstances in which it was written and, and and the time in which it was written, you see that it's far less than the complete story of his life. And and uh, it, he's basically in his autobiography he tells the story of how he became Gandhi and about it, and much of it has to do with his experiences. In South Africa, uh, but he was writing it. He had a weekly newspaper, and he was writing it as a series of articles for the weekly newspaper. And his real motive, and he did this 20 years before he died, and his real motive was to energize the movement and, and uh, convey a sense of values to uh, his followers. Uh, so each of these chapters of his life became a kind of parable. If you read it with that in mind, you, you you learn a lot about Gandhi, but it's it's not the last word about what happened to him. Uh, 
in another time and place. Should we have one more question? Is there anybody with a I have a question for Johnny. Yes, yes. My last question was, uh, so you got to see the president and talk to him about his, his mother. Did you come away with the feeling that he uh, uh, really understood what his mother had accomplished professionally and that he had taken the full measure of the complicated life she had led? Or do you suspect that uh, he learned a few things from a singular woman? Um, he, I was struck that he had a greater appreciation than he had indicated in his writings or the things that he had spoken about her. That my impression is that he had spoken pretty narrowly about her in, in certain contexts, you know, during the campaign as a um, single mother on food stamps or the um, woman who died fighting with her insurance company, but, but not emphasized to perhaps a politically shrewd calculation of the fact that she was an anthropologist who worked, who spent more than half of her adult life in Indonesia. You know, uh, uh, he didn't, he stayed away from some of the details that they don't even necessarily belong in a, in a political campaign, but, or possibly in his book, but that's, and the book he only covered her sort of when she was relatively young, so he doesn't even address her, her work. Um, and a lot of that work took place really after he was no longer living with her, because he was living in the United States after the age of 13 when she was back in Indonesia doing her field work, which led to her international development work, which led to her work in microfinance. So I think, like many children who don't really understand the nitty gritty of their, what their parents do uh, professionally, that, that problem was exacerbated here by the fact that it was happening a half a world away um, on a, in a, you know, different time zones without good telephone service. So his, his, his understanding of it is going to be limited anyway. But yes, I do think he uh, probably uh, learned quite a lot. I know that his sister told me that she learned a lot from this book that she had no idea about. Um, and I'm assuming since she lived with her mother for her entire childhood that she probably had as good an idea as anybody. So I do think there's just things that one doesn't know. Um, and I, I've heard that he, in speaking since that time, sometimes speaks in much greater detail than he used to about her work. So perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.